problems that one, one faces and that how, do you, how, do you, how do you address them? Um, certainly, you've seen that, you know, um, if you try to set it up right, so although there are three, three variables, um, one not being restricted to positive values basically made it four variables. If you, so if you try to write it in the standard form that um, you end up with a much larger dimension um, problem, right? And um, I'm not trying to hide the fact that there are packages out there that can, you know, handle this for you, so you don't have to worry anything about it. I mean, the whole point is we're trying to kind of, um, before we run to those packages and just use them, um, it would be best to kind of understand what's, what's the theory behind it. Um, now, what are the steps for, you know, once you have a, a so let me, let me first remind you what was the um, standard form, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go uh, work about the specific problem. Yep. Question. Yeah, um, these homework problems, uh, there was not any solutions in this book unless I got you know, shorted on this book or whatever. Is there a solutions manual? Are there solutions to these problems? And do they expect you to work them all by hand in this, in this book? It just says solve. So are they uh, expecting that? Not by hand, but pretty much the tools you have available. I'm not saying you. I'm just saying the author of this book. Are they right. Available by hand. Um, I'm just curious. I think some like the in the next homework there is one that says specifically use a like a computer. Um, To have the solutions. Right. Well, my take on it is, you know, in real life, you work on a problem, you don't have solutions to check your work. So, you know, I mean, if if you if you're concerned about the grading, I mean. True, I understand. I mean, it would be it would be ideal, but the fact that we don't have those um, in a way is good, because and that's what I'm trying to tell all my students from Calculus One on is like you don't want to really. I mean, part of the problem, part of part of solving the problem is kind of being confident that what you have is right, right? If you don't have it right, I mean, it's not a disaster as long as you have made your best attempt to get it right, okay? I mean, if it's, if it's not the numbers that it is in the back of the book, it's, it doesn't matter so much to me, okay? That's why I'd like to see a worked out solution to some of these. Okay, and I'll, I'll have some of the solutions worked out. Um, no, not for all of them, but no, I mean, I don't think the book comes with a solution. Um, Okay, so let me first just remind you, LPP in standard form, you have a, a minimization of a linear functional subject to AX equals B when X is positive. Yeah. Yeah, before class. Yes, please. Um, yes? Would it be possible for me to build a simplex tableau? Like, I understand, you know, finding the B in the end, but how all that relates to the simplex tableau, I'm not making the connection that I'm trying to see this. Yes. Well, I'll do it for this specific problem, number five, if that's okay. Um, 
So, or we we can do it for over something easier if you'd like. I mean, let's let's just take something easier first, and then um, here's example two point six, for instance. Okay, so it says uh, minimize. It's already in standard form, so it's minimize. 3x1 plus x2 plus 9x3 plus x4 subject to x1 plus 2x3 plus x4 equals 4 x2 plus x3 minus x4 equals 2 and x all x's are positive so it is in standard form, right? Now the other thing that somebody pointed in, in the homework was like number four, there was a typo. Right. There was an X2 plus an X2, I mean, so I didn't catch that, but thanks for pointing out. I mean, because of the number of, of, of constants that's come and number of, you know, the variables that show, you know, you, have, you just have to be careful. Like, even now when I copy something, you know, I want to make sure that it's correct. Um, all right. So, the <coughs> let me just start by by, by setting the the, the 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 simplex tableau here. And of course, here we don't have inequality constraints, so you know. Maybe this came from an inequality constraint LPP, but we don't have a sp distinction of what's you know slack or not. But it's just x1 through x4. So you're going to basically put the all the variables that come show up in the standard form, and below you're going to put the uh, coefficients, right, of the constraints. So you're going to have one, t zero, two, one, zero, one. 1, negative 1. Huh? Now sometimes you might want to put also the uh, objective. Okay, but that's really a, a column that never changes. Okay, so let's just for, for brevity, let's just not put it. Not, uh, but if you see it in some, some places, that's basically all, uh, all it's all it's doing is to keep track of the um, to, to basically say that the, the rows of this tableau indicate the exact, the exact constraints. Um, what is on the last column? We put the right hand right side, right? And you would actually, I mean, basically this this shows the constraints, right? So this would actually indicate the feasible region, which is what we said was that um, flat surf, you know, flat, flat, um, uh, a translate of a subspace of R4, right? But cut by the the positive cone or the quadrant, if you want. Okay. But because we also have, you know, taking account the the uh, objective function, we, we also want to put that here. So um, let's see. I think you've got to you've got to change the signs, don't you? We're minimizing. We're minimizing. Yeah, you don't change the sign, so you just put there three one nine one zero and zero, right? So zero is the okay. So now the next step. So basically, this tableau is gonna. Um, encodes everything in the problem, 
And what you'd like to do is you'd like to transform this tableau so that it represents a vertex. Um, vertex by vertex, right? That you, you kind of moving on to get to the optimal vertex, the optimal uh, uh, solution. Okay, so the first, the first uh, thing to do is to identify the basic variables, right? Okay, so the, for the basic variables, we, what did we say? We said you have to pick basically a metric, a submetrix of A. A is this basic, A is this matrix. So let me let me give some names here. This is called the last row is called the indicator row indicator indicator row. Um, this is going to be the A matrix. Right, and this is going to be the B column, the right hand side. Okay, and it's it's A and B that comes show up in here, and of course this is C. I had a different color. The bottom would be the C. So what's the basic variables? Well, one choice, I mean, the first choice would be to say, well, this 2 by 2 matrix is non-singular in this particular case, right? And so let's, let's remember this was B. So the idea is to write, so initial choice, A to B, B and N such that bx b <coughs> so x was x b and x n now we said that the extreme points and we haven't given proof uh, of that yet but we said that the extreme the extreme points of this feasible region consists of of, of um, uh, vectors of solutions that have how many zeros in this case, in this case we have two. basically four minus two so it's you know the difference between the size the, the size of the of the metrics four minus two so you have two zeros right so just a matter of where those two zeros happen do they happen on the First two, you know, spots on which which of the four variables uh, are zero. That's the initial choice we make, right? And uh, those will be the, the non-essential or non-basic variables. So we're going to set x n equals zero. And then, of course, AX equals B just, just consists of um, the sub-block BX, right? So, so basically, AX will then be BXB B 
So that's what we're looking for, solving bxb equals little b. And of course, xb has to be positive. Okay. So let's, go, let's come back to our um, tableau here. We're going to say we're looking for a matrix, non-singular matrix, so that when I set that equal to the right-hand side, I get positive numbers. Right? So the, the very first time you see kind of an identity matrix here, like 1 and 1, 0 and 0, and you see a positive right-hand side, that's a good choice because what does that imply? That implies that if I pick B to be just 2 by 2, then X1 will be 4, X2 will be 2, and the others will be 0. Right? So X1 equals 4, X2 equals 0. Those are basic. And of course, X3 equals 0. Uh, excuse me, this was 2. X4 equals 0. These were non basic. So far, so good? But you're saying it doesn't have to be the identity? It doesn't have to be the identity. It's an initial choice. In fact, there's a whole section uh, in this chapter well, uh, that talks about how to make this initial choice. You can make it, you can pick your vertex. If you can put a hand on, your, on the vertex, you can pick that vertex. So. If somebody else wants um, not, not these two to be the basic variables, but maybe this last two, what do you want to make sure? You want to make sure that this matrix is non-singular, and it is, right? But in addition to that, you want to make sure that when you solve just this system, so with, in terms of x3 and x4 equals 4 and 2, that the solution, which will be the unique solution, has positive components. And that may happen or may not happen. I mean, you don't know until you solve it, right? In fact, that was one of the complications in this problem number five that I'm going to show you in a second. Um, but here is sort of kind of easy, right? If you can, uh, if you have, if you see an identity matrix and the right hand sides are positive, that's a, that's the obvious choice, right? Positive or zero, because we're 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 under the um, restriction that all the components have to be positive. So that simplex, or not simplex, the the feasible set is in the positive cone. So when you make your initial choice, you have to have it in there. You cannot pick it to be somewhere in the, in the negative. You have to have a feasible solution to start with. Now, just just to point, if 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 one of these were negative, because these are equality constraints, you could always make it positive by multiplying by a negative sign. So you can always make this positive, the right hand side. You can always make the right hand side of the equality constraints positive. But of course, then you would kind of change the matrix here. In the end, if you had an identity here, or you no longer have an identity, and so forth. That's true. It's true even if you have slack variables. So if you have slack variables, remember the slack variables appear exactly as with, with identity metrics. But if the right hand side is not all positive, you cannot peak those slack variables as being the basic variables. What would amount to be able to peak the slack variables initially as the basic variables? It means the x1 through whatever the real variables you have are all zero, meaning you start with the vertex at zero. You, if possible, you would always want to start with the vertex at zero, right? If you have an inequality constraint. But sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes the feasible set doesn't include the origin. Because sometimes the inequalities are greater than or equal to rather than less than or equal to. That's exactly, again, the problem uh, in, that, in that number five. So there were lots of problems in, in number five. It was sort of a jump, sort of. Um, 
Okay, so we, we fix the basic variables and the non-basic variables. Okay, what's the next step? Well, the next step is look at the cost or the objective function. Okay, so the cost cost is as a row. Is this is it's always important to you know what you write you know, you know what you write is it a row or is it a, a column so <coughs> um, and it's always whatever components so how many components are here m these are the number of basic variables and n minus m components here right and if they happen to not be the first two you can always swap the rows uh, the columns so it's not a, you know it's not a kind of it's not restrictive to just write like this even if even if it's not the choice is not the first two are the basic variables okay so then you're going to say well what is c times x that's the cost c times x right so this is CB XB plus CN XN. I'm trying to stick with the annotation in the book just to make it easier to follow. But um, okay. But now, actually, from last time, you remember what happened when we changed. Um, when we computed XB in terms of XN. So I'm going to just use uh, the... Oops. A relation that we had last time. Um, Well, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm jumping over myself. At this point, x n is zero. So that at this point, the non-essential variables are set to to be non-basic variables are set to be zero. So this is just c b x b. Okay. So this is whatever the positive basic variables you had on that initial vertex times whatever the coefficients are of the cost function, um, this is going to be the, the cost that you start with. Now you want to move to the next vertex. To the next vertex. And to move to the next vertex in this in this feasible region, which again it's um, would like to be able to move on another extreme point. So we'd like to be able to keep those in that example two, zero, zero, uh, two, two of the variables to be zero, but not the same variables. So we have to kind of swap one of the two variables. So the first, these were the zero, zero ones, x3 and x4, but now we want to do maybe x1 equals zero, and of course then we have to remove one of that. So there's this entering variable so we'd like again to have this which is zero on the last two, of course, with some reshuffling if necessary. Um, and we'd like to keep x b star so that uh, 
we still preserve the constraint. Of course, x is still positive. X bar is still positive, right? And of course, the main uh, uh, objective is to increase the, I'm sorry, the, to decrease the cost, right? And the new cost Right. So let's see what that amounts to. So you get x Did is, if I understood the procedure right, I, I just chose the variable corresponding to the entry into the indicator row that was largest. Is that right? I mean, it ends up being like that. Um, but the reason is why? Is that <laughs> yeah. The question? Is right. Right. Yes. We're going to build a new table, right? But in the ch making the choice of the of the new variable of the variable that enters, you know, a non-zero variable that enters, and uh, and uh, one of the old variables that becomes zero. That's how you make the the choice, the pivot of that tableau, basically. Um, and I'm just. Uh, pause a little bit here, just because the new vertex should have zero on the non-essential variables. I mean, that's um, that's what all the extreme points should have. I see, I see. But okay, all right. So. If you follow the uh, what what what's uh, the computation done in the book, then then you'll you'll see a little bit different. Basically, in which this is left uh, unchanged. So, what I what. Uh, it's just a notational uh, kind of nightmare. The fact that what I wrote there is I already assumed we've picked our new basic variables and we've swapped them to, sh to be first on the first, uh, these on the first order. I mean, basically, we reorder the variables. Okay? But I think, I think to, um, to clarify this a little bit is to, to say that we're going to make our choices of the new variables, but we're not going to swap them. So this is before we do the swap. So before swapping um, variables. And the reason for it, you don't want to do that yet is because when you set this constraint, you want to work with the same metrics A. You don't want to 
uh, swap the uh, the columns. So x x b and x n equals b. So you get b x b bar plus n x n. But this time x n is not zero. It's going to have a not. It's going to have a non-zero. So where x n has one non-zero component, and that's what we're looking for. That's what. That's the entering variable. Okay. So this, in conjunction with the uh, what we had uh, previously, that said that b x b was b implies if you kind of um, well we want to find x b bar equals b x b so x b is x b bar is x b minus b inverse n x n okay This is still unknown, right? But what, what we'd like to do is make a smart choice of, of this non-essential variables. In other words, of the entering variable. So that the cost, so now just write what the cost is. So the cost, and again, this is before swapping, is CX bar is CB, CN, x b bar x n so this is c b x b bar plus c n x n and now just plug in what the basic the new basic variables look like x b minus b inverse n x n plus c n x n and when you multiply this through I mean this Again, this is a row times columns, so it's all like metrics multiplication. You can do distributive law, and um, you can associate whichever way you want. But you can see that CBXB, which was the cost of the initial vertex, plus and now there is an xn that factors out and a cn minus cb b inverse n. Okay, so this this is the new term. This is the extra. This is the difference from the initial cost to the new cost. C, I'm sorry. So this was C X bar. Okay. One more line. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's in the book. It's in the book, so it doesn't. Okay. So, the new the cost evaluated or the function the objective function at the new vertex is the cost at the old vertex plus this new term, right? Since you'd like to kind of decrease that cost, then you want this term to be negative, okay? Now keep in mind, xn, sorry if you don't see that. Do you guys see it here? Not really. I can move this, so this is kind of a bummer. Um, so what you want is you want this, so what we want is this expression which is called um, our vector of reduced cost if you like uh, the name is not important though you want this which is a row this is a row and it hits a column right what you'd like, remember this, you have a choice. You have a choice of picking the one component to be non-zero in Xn and the others to be zero. 
So, <coughs> if this if this vector rho vector has, for instance, all the components that are positive, if all the components of this are positive, then you, you only can choose this to be positive. So you're all you're always going to increase the cost, not decrease the cost, right? So that's basically going to be the end of the of the uh, of the optimization. If this vector has positive or zero components, you cannot decrease the cost any any further, right? Now there's an additional argument which is kind of always left out, which says, well, so why is this then the optimal? Why is that vertex the optimal? If you cannot if you cannot move to a, to a different vertex through this, you know, entering and leaving variables procedure, if you cannot move to a one that has a smaller cost, why is then the optimal? Maybe there is another procedure by which you can jump to a to a vertex that it would be sort of a smaller cost. And that argument has to do with the convexity of the of the um, of the feasible set. That when you do this kind of, you change only one of the components. Well, two. I mean, you make one zero and you won't, won't make the other, another non-zero. That you're actually moving to an adjacent vertex. And and what is the saying? is that if this has positive components, that you cannot move to any adjacent uh, vertex and still be able to decrease the cost. And if you cannot move to any adjacent, convexity kind of comes and says, well, then no, no other will actually be able to do that. But what we want is, we want this to have at least uh, one negative component. Otherwise, we've already reached the optimal solution. And we cannot decrease uh, the cost anymore. Okay. Now there is one one other um, ingredient here is that if there is if this vector has at least one negative component component, then you'd like to kind of move, increase the cost the greatest. So then the idea is to pick up the one that's most negative. Okay, so the simplex step, the, so if R has uh, at least, well, okay. Okay, let me do this. If this is positive, then done, right? Otherwise, pick the most negative component. Of R, okay? And that would be the entering variable. And the story is then that you pick that particular component to be non-zero, but what's the magnitude of that is has to be dictated by, so basically it's going to be zero, zero,
So V stands for just the um, vector of the basis, of the standard basis in Rn. So just with one on that particular component. But probably you don't, you, you're, you, you're not going to be exactly on, on picking one. You have to pick some scalar, right? So some T, where T is positive. Okay? And that value of t is going to be determined by the exiting variable. Okay. So now let's go back to that tableau and, and, and say, um, for this particular case, which will be the entering variable? So let's see. which is, is right here, right? So what do we need to do? We need to look at CB minus, at that, at that CN, excuse me. So CN is this, right? CB is this. Yeah? B is the identity and N is this. So what you have to compute is So in, in uh, our example, R is, well, B was the identity, N was <coughs> 2, 1, 181, right? And R is CN minus CB, B inverse N. And C, C, okay, so C and was, C, B was 3, 1, C, N was 9, 1. So R ends up being 2 and negative 1. Okay? Now, is this just two components because it actually hits xn, so it hits the non-essential, non-basic variables. Yeah? And we have one that's negative, and that's the one we're going to use it as the entering variable. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Show me more detail from the one to the other. From where? From here to here? Yeah, I need to Okay. Um, hoping I can get away. Um, so it's just nine one. CB is three one. Now B inverse. I mean, I'm kind of exploring the fact that B equals. I mean, B inverse is the identity as well, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have to do any that step. Um, N is two one one eighty one. So this is going to be 9, 1, minus, well, matrix multiplication, 7, 2, that's it, right? That's 2, negative 1. But if B were not the identity, then you would have to find the inverse, okay? Now. Practically finding the inverse of a matrix has its own problems. So many, you know, many times you, you do this Gaussian elimination in the simplex tableau. Uh, I mean, that's what you do. That's one way to find the inverse anyway uh, with raw, raw operations. Okay? But here is not necessary. Yep. You also need to have the, the inverse of the 
inverse to find that x sub b in the first place, don't you? I mean, yes, they, yes. They developed, yes. they use that to find the initial x sub b, not x bar sub b, but the x sub b. Exactly. In the initial step, that was very important, that you pick the vertex so that it's, it's uh, the b times x sub b is little b, right? Has a positive solution, and that's not. I mean, not every not every metrics, capital B, invertible metrics, and any vector little b, will satisfy that, right? So you have to make it. So you have to find the inverse of b if you can. But you know, in in, in computations, if it's a big matrix b, it's it's a hard thing, right? All right. So that's. That's R. So uh, again, what's this? What's this saying? This is saying that x4 is the entering variable. Yeah, because this remember this hits the the column vector xn. And xn, in our, in our case, before doing any swapping, was x3, x4. Okay. Right. It always hits xn. Because remember, this times xn is that extra thing that decides if the cost has been lowered or not. And when you make your choice, You'd like to pick the non-zero variable that that he, that is multiplied by a negative component so that you can decrease the cost. You wouldn't pick x3 to be a non-zero variable because this would increase the cost. Okay. No. That's supposed to correspond to the largest or the smallest entry in the indicator row. It does correspond to the smallest. Smallest, okay. Yeah. <coughs> right. So you, so it kind of, you kind of start seeing that. Um, the indicator role has numbers that. You know, the the magnitude of those will tell you, you know, which one uh, the entering variable should be. Okay. All right. So. If this is if this is the entering variable x4, now we have to find one of the previous basic variables that has to be leaving, that has to be zero, set to zero. Okay? How do you do that? Well, <clears throat> so back to the simplex tableau. And again, one zero two one zero one one eighty one four two three. Okay, now what you do is you're gonna say once we fix the entering a variable, so we look at this column, this is the X four column. We look at the ratios of the right hand sides and this coefficients of x4. I'll explain that in a second. So we look at the ratios 4 over 1, that's 4, and 2 over negative 1, that's negative 2. Okay? And we're going to we're going to decide on the which which of the variables x1 and x2 should be set to zero based on these ratios. 
<clears throat> okay, and why is that? But basically, we have to say XB. Remember, XB was X. B, uh, XB bar, XB, B inverse N minus B inverse N times X sub N. In XB bar, because we haven't reshuffled uh, the, the columns or the variables, in XB bar, one of them has to be zero. We have to see which one we have to pick to be zero in this, in this uh, one of the components of this. Well, <clears throat> Xn we said it's it's chosen as just a one non-zero component. So this is Xb minus T B N inverse X V. Okay. And this is T is a scalar, T is positive. And if you look at the components of XB bar, they become linear functions of t, of little t. Remember, we have to know how big t should be. Well, we're going to pick it. We're going to pick it up. Um, we're going to take it to be the biggest t we, or the, the value of t that we we can pick, so that one of these components vanishes. Okay. Now, there are several cases. It's possible that, that the original X beam had some zero components, right? The, some of the original basic variables could have been zero. That's a, the general case, but it is possible. You certainly have a original, the original non-basic variables to be zero, but some of the basic ones could also be zero. It's only greater than or equal to zero that has to happen. So you could be starting from a positive, uh, from, from a zero, you know, when t is zero, then this will be zero. I'm just talking about any components of, of this vector. Okay? So pick a component. These are the cases that can happen. You can start at zero, and a linear function that starts at zero either goes up or down, right? So certainly never becomes zero again. Okay? So that's not going to give us, that's not going to tell us which new variable we should set to be zero. You know? Moreover, it will actually make this component of XB bar increase or decrease indefinitely. Okay. If you have a positive, or if you have a non-zero, if if let's say all the all the uh, XBs, all the components of XB are non-zero, then a linear function that starts somewhere that's not zero can either intersect the, X, the 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 axis, so hit a zero at some point, or never hit the zero. Right. So just think about a line in the plane. Uh, line in the in the um, versus the horizontal line. You can go up or down, or you know. So the ideal case is when you can get a zero when it wasn't a zero before by picking a positive t. And you really want a strictly positive t because that's t times v is that what we said is that entering variable that has to be a non-zero value. So, so t really has to be non-zero, but the idea is to pick up the um, a zero from a positive value for t. Okay. So <coughs> um, so so to 
uh, achieve a zero component for x b bar because that's what we want the leaving variable the leaving variable we need uh, <clears throat> um, positive t the let's see the greatest the largest possible such that such that the component of this vector vanishes so basically such that b um well b inverse b i should have said what that 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 was really x b is b inverse b we talked about that minus or equals t b inverse n t so we really want um at least on one component so do you want to call it i you can that's what it basically says at least one component of this equals the corresponding component of this well proportional to one of the component of this the largest possible t why the largest possible t Remember, T affects how much the cost is decreased. Because it was, Xn was T on that non zero component. So the bigger the T, the smaller the cost. The, the, more, the more decrease in the cost, right? The bigger the T, the more the, increase, uh, the decrease in the cost. So basically, you just have to look at this ratio. Uh, let's see, B inverse B or B inverse and V. You look at the maximum of this. And what is the maximum? So this is the ratio of those components. Now, you'll, you'll say, well, so how do we figure this out? Well, in that simplex tableau, when you do the row, when you reduce reduced row echelon, excuse me, the um, yeah the reduced row echelon form of those tableaus, then B inverse B is going to be exactly the right side, and this is going to be the exactly the one that is the entering column. Hmm? So the ratio of that has to be maximum. Now, why is that? Does that allow you to like skip other vertices that might satisfy that aren't optimal? You're actually skipping some yeah. there, so you're doing less iterations. You're doing less. Yeah. The least number of iterations. You're trying to at each iteration, you're trying to increase the cost the most. Mm -hmm. You can by only going to adjacent vertex. So you. You're not skipping. You're going to adjacent vertices, but you're going in a direction that is maximized. But um, <clears throat> let me just <clears throat> make sure this is to the least. Why is that least? Okay, so it should be the smallest, not the largest. Yeah, at least positive. But, I mean, positive is positive anyway. Well, why is that? If one of them had a negative denominator, you wouldn't use that. I agree. But I think the argument here is, why do you pick the smallest t? I guess it's because that's the first time it hits. OK, yeah, makes sense. Uh, so it wasn't, it, it had nothing to do with the, um, 
with the fact that yeah, it has nothing to do with, this, with the fact that the it, it entered in that in that R. So it wasn't like it was you were increasing the most, you were decreasing the most the cost. So that, that was a. Um, the, the fact of the matter is you start with t equals zero and you increase t the very first time where you hit a zero that's the living variable so that's why you, you have to pick at the smallest t where, that, where, where that's happening so it's not the max but it's the minimum is the least so the least that is positive is positive okay so that's why those ratios are relevant. And of course, in our example, we have one positive, one negative. So you discard the negative. You only have one positive, so that's the positive value. And that is telling you what the, the living variable is. So the living, the living variable is x1. Because the ratio, this this is the ratio corresponding to positive, the, the positive ratio, the least positive ratio. You go here and you say, well, in the basic variables, what which one of the of the variables is going to vanish when you choose that ratio to be four? Which well, corresponds to x one. That's the first one that's going to vanish. If you let t start from 0 up to 4. Up to, no, what, what was that? Up to 4, yes. And you always pick one of the basic variables, right? Yeah. Or that's your x1 or x2. What was previously basic, one of them has to become 0 and has to move to the non-basic. And the fundamental thing is 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 because of that, that fact, that, that that uh, the feasible set has extreme points, extremal points of the feasible set are, have this uh, property. N minus M are zero. Okay? Okay? So, what's the next step? Just quickly. You're yes. Discarding the negative ratios. Discarding the negative ratios. And the reason they say discard the ones with negative denominator is because you're assuming your B column is always positive. Is that correct? Discarding the ones with negative denominator. Did they say that somewhere? Yeah. Well, it's basically to say that the, um, discard the ones that have zero denominators. Be, because then the ratio will be infinite. So well, you should read that. So it says select only the ones with positive denominator means with non-zero denominators. Now, whether they're positive or negative, that you can just put a minus in the ratio. You can put a minus across the row. And it's not going to change the ratio. In other words, if you have a negative denominator, that's you don't you shouldn't discard it because then also this should also be negative. But it's the one that is zero. If you have zero in the denominator, if you, which means if you have zero in the pivot column, that should be discarded. Why? Because that thing zero means zero times t. So that means that you're kind of going flat, so you cannot gain a zero in XB bar. Okay. So yeah, so right. So if the ratio happens to be infinite because of, of, the, of, of, of some of these are zero, 
then that's also not, you know, it's not going to achieve you a, a variable that becomes zero. So you can, you can discard it. That makes sense? Of course, it is hard, you know, unless you, you see lots of examples or you see sort of, it's hard to kind of generalize this uh, or understand this general rule. Let me, um, okay, and, and then what will be the next step? Just once you've, 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 you've identified this number or this, or this column, right? Then what you need to do is you say, well, now the basic variables are x4 and x2. So now B is going to be this matrix. Now whether you move it to the front of that table is optional, right? And N will be this one, right? So how do you actually do the next thing? You can, you can make this 1 and 0, and then 0 and 1. So you take the B inverse. Right? So you do raw operations on this to get 1, 0, 0, 1. Of course, these things will change. And again, you're going to look for the, for the least value of, of, of in the, on the indicator row. And then you're going to do the ratios. You're going to pick the least positive ratio. And you, that's how you're going to get the new pivot. Okay? Of course, the mo most of the work is... Once you've uh, fixed the pivot, once you've identified the pivot, how to proceed? I mean, you have to do reduced Rochelin form, which you know may not be pleasant. Now, let me uh, quickly go back about number five, since we have um, several issues there. Well. The first issue is we have inequality constraints. And not only that, but one inequality is one way, the other inequality is the other way. And of course the worst is no restriction on X3. Okay, now let's just for a second pretend that we could ignore that warning and say, okay, let's just do it for x3 positive. Okay? You would really be doing a different problem. Because your feasible region would be different than what it is here. Okay? It would be a subset, sub, sub region. Next thing is you could actually be looking at an empty set. set. I mean, right? We don't know. Um, furthermore, could you pick the, uh, the, the zero as your initial guess or initial vertex for x to start the walk starting from zero? No, zero, 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 zero is not in the feasible region because of the second inequality, right? So this means when we introduce the slack variables, we cannot use the slack variables as the basic variables. If, if zero is, is, is satisfies the constraints, I think you should always pick that, right? But in this case, it won't be possible. So in standard form, What is the standard form? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, I will sort of, I'm fighting the time here, so there will be things that, you know, maybe I won't have time to uh, mention, So, then, but, but, but they should be in the book, and part of your homework is to actually kind of combine the two. So, um, and one of the little things was, was yeah, how do you, treat the case when you don't have a, a constraint for x for one of the variables. You just write it as a difference where this is the positive part and this is the negative part. 
Um, and of course, you also have two slack variables. So, so you're going to have six. So you're going to be, well, let's do minimization. So minus, I'm going to replace minus, minus. And I have minus 2x3, which is plus 2y1 minus 2y2. OK? So I've done two things at the same time. Subject to, and now I have to write equality constraints, right? So we're going to have 4x1 plus 2x2 plus 2x3 minus, uh, excuse me, plus 2y1 minus 2y2. Plus u1 equals 20. And what's the other one? The other one is the inequality is the opposite, right? So remember what we have to do? Minus 2x1, minus 2x2, minus 4x3, which is minus 4y1, plus 4y2, plus u2 equals negative 6. And of course, the inequality constraints kind of resume to re re become that these two new slack variables are positive, which is standard form. Yes? It makes no difference in static, you just subtract the u2. Right. If you subtract? The u2 instead of. No, it makes no difference. Right, so you can always change it all across the signs. Uh, that's it. So this is the standard form. All the x's, y's, and u's are, have to be positive, so this, and I have equality. Wonderful, right? Um, so just build a simplex tableau. 4, 2, 2, negative 2, 1, 0, 20. Yeah, it could actually be even easier. I don't know. Is, is the same. 0, 1, negative 60, negative 6. Um, negative 3, negative 2, 2, negative 2, 0, 0, 0. Okay? Again, why do we put 0 here on the bottom? If I would have put an, uh, another column for the, the objective function, 0, 0, 1, which I, I said is never going to change when you do raw operations, then you would be able to say, well, multiply this with this and that with that, and this would equal 0. Because P, the objective, which comes with 1 here, minus this equals that. Right? So you would be able to say, kind of replace this with equality all, all through. But that would, that would mean you would put a 0, 0, 1 column that would, you'd have to carry all along, which is, which is OK. But um, OK. <coughs> OK. First question is, what are the basic variables for the first step, initial step? Well, how many? Two, right? You have to make a, of course, these are just indicator row, and this is the right-hand side. So this is only the matrix 2 by 6 by 2. I mean, 2 by 6. Um, so you want a 2 by 2 matrix. Well, wouldn't it be nice to just pick this? You would, but, but look at this. You wouldn't have the solution to be positive. So picking this means you set all the other variables to 0, but then you wouldn't have a, a feasible solution. So you can do that. So you want you to basic variables? No. Because Setting b equal to that, and you know, um, you wouldn't be able to get positive solutions, right? 
Um, so you just have to find basically a two by two matrix, which when you invert and, and hit multiply by this, you get a positive solution. Okay, that's a hard thing to do in general. Um, because what if you don't find it in the first trial? Yeah. Try it a second trial, a second choice, and basically in the end it's it's doing the problem from from scratch. Um, yeah, it's always like if you can just find one, go go ahead, right? Otherwise, you just really have to you know go to a computer and you know make a computer do the work for you. Or as we'll talk a little bit, in, there's actually a systematic way to to find the initialization to make the initialization. There are two ways actually the book talks about, which is kind of, and there's not the only ones. Yeah. So is, are these problems possible to do on that, uh, that applet? No. Okay. That was actually one thing that I wanted to take uh, home from. It's like, well, I've shown you an applet that, that allows for uh, inequality constraints, but just three variables, right? And it shows you a nice um, feasible set and so forth. But that automatically implies you're looking at the first octant. And so you have that restriction. So that's why you're looking at a different problem. And you can do it like that and compare. And you will see that, in fact, the solution to this will have a negative component. So it wouldn't be that what you would get from that uh, applet. So the question. You don't know until you solve it. Oh. But I mean, if you get a negative component, because there's no restriction on x3, so possibly you could get a vertex that's somewhere where x3 is negative. And what I'm saying is, if you end up like that, then you know that making a, m a more restrictive assumption on x3 certainly changes the problem. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. Is that a question? Variables. Yeah. Well, what you want is you want B. Remember B, because if B were, you want B x B equals B to have a positive. And if you pick U one and two, and you solve this equals that you won't get positive. Okay? So, um, if anybody, if any of you actually actually uh, moved any further from than this point, which is great, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to grade you on not being able to move forward. Uh, what have you, which ones did you pick? Did you pick? The first two? Okay. Um, keep in mind, you know, I mean, sure, it doesn't, it's, an, it's a non-singular and that's fine. Um, I'd like to kind of keep this as much, I'd like to have zeros in my metrics because the inversion is easier. So I'd like to keep like U1 and the first one here. If I do that, you can automatically see negative 2x1 has to be negative 6, so x1 has to be 3, which is positive already. And the only thing I have to look is 4 times 3, 12, plus U1 has to be 20. So U1 has to be 8. So they're both positive. So you can pick the slack as You can pick, uh, yeah. These are no longer slack. You know, it's just, they're all variables now. That's a good thing to, you know, you can only, only think of the slack at the very end. Right now they're all the same. Uh, so you just have to pick two of them. Mm -hmm. Is non and the solution is Exactly. So let me just say if I pick x1 and u1 as a basic, <coughs> then I have b is 4, 1, negative 2, 0. 
which is non-singular. I mean, it has determinant. Um, and solving B times, you know, x1, no, x1, u1 equals 20 and negative 6 gives me positive components. Now, <coughs> that being said, um, I don't want to take the inverse of the metrics. I just want to do row uh, operations so that the first component that I, uh, the first row column that I picked as one of the basic becomes one zero, uh, zero one, zero one, because I have the one zero there. Oh no 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 yeah 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 yeah. You can make it zero one and one zero because remember the order doesn't matter. In the end, yes, you would have to kind of swap the columns in your mind, if, but you don't have to do that on paper. So, basically, uh, using row operations, elementary row operations, uh, to make the x1 column 0, 1. And I'll tell you what I got, um, and you can do it. I got the following. I got 0, 1, 0 for the first column, negative 2, 1, 1, negative 6, 2, 8, 6, 2, negative 2, negative 8, 1, 0, 0, 2, negative 1 half. And maybe, maybe uh, my choice was bad since I got fractions, but I don't know. Who knows? Maybe maybe your choice didn't get any fractions. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, the, the last row is the same indicator in this. Okay? But now look. Now you have 1, 0, 0, 1. And of course, swapping them would, would be, would make it, you know, the identity for for B, right? Okay. It's okay to pivot with the switch. I'm just kind of yeah, but you just have to write it again. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can uh, switch the labels too. Switch labels. You have to switch the labels too, yeah. Um, practically, it's better to just keep the order and remember that, you know, you have to make identities, but with possibly swapping the. It's for the break. On the tape. Okay. Thank you. All right. So this this is one thing. Let's let's just uh, move to the next step. So right now, what do we have? The uh, basic are x1, u1, and we have what? x2, y1, y2, u2 non-basic. So what's the vertex that corresponds to this? Can you tell me? Or the solution? What's x1? Three. X, y, uh, x2? Zero. X2 is non-basic, that's zero. All of these are zero, that's a good thing. Y1? Zero. Y2? Zero. U1? Eight. U2? Zero. So in that six-dimensional, well, it's not really six-dimensional, it's four-dimensional, right? Uh, in, 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 well, well, it's in the six-dimensional space, but the feasible set is four-dimensional. This is one of the this is the extreme point where you start your your search. Okay. Next, we're trying to make one that was zero, non-zero, and 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 um, one of the two that was basic and happened to be non-zero, both zero. Yeah? So how do we choose the 
variable where we are not, we are going to make it a non-zero entry. We're going to look at the <coughs> most negative component in the in the in the indicator row. So it's obvious it's negative eight. This is solving criteria. I guess I have to clarify why this. I mean, you're really looking at the most negative in the R. And the question is why why is this thing in why is this the R? Okay. I mean, the initial step is always you start with the with the with the with the coefficients, right? Of c. But once you start doing the the raw the raw uh, operations, you kind of do that b inverse. You can apply the b inverse b, and and what you're going to look at is is the r. Okay. So the very first time you you apply the row, uh, the reduced row echelon uh, form, the indicator uh, a row is going to contain the the R, which is yes. So is that why on the example you did first, we had no negatives at the bottom, but we hadn't done any. We haven't done anything yet. Yeah. yeah so that's why we the very first time we you do, you're going to have some negatives, and when you stop having any negatives, that's when you're going to have, because that's the R. So the indicator row is going to contain the R components of R. That's what you know is going to say we have to stop or not, right? But the very first time you haven't done anything, you just put the C, C B and C N, right? Um, so pick. What was this? Y two is the entering. And then what's the ex exiting variable? Well, you have to do 8 over 6, 3 over negative 2. So the first row, I mean, the first ratio is going to be the, the only positive one. And that corresponds to what variable? U1, right? So what will be the, the new is going to be x1 and y2 is going to be basic, and the rest is going to be non-basic. Okay, and you perform reduce row echelon form so that that becomes that column becomes one zero zero, right? Everything else is going to change, and you're going to get the new vertex. So we're gonna uh, take a can take a five minute break, seven minute break, and come back. <laughs>